Um, and I think we can begin right over here with Ann. Thanks, Peter. Um, Ann O'Meara from NCI. So as I listened, this was a great presentation. And as I listened to you, I thought of my years of 25 years ago when we implemented, JCO did the pain scale. And with a little bit of history, 25 years fast forward, we now have an epidemic of overuse, abuse, and over, over treatment, and the ERs. Now, I don't see that, but what we didn't see 20 years ago, 25 years ago, is the unintended consequences of what we did. So that's my question to you, is what do you see as sort of an unintended consequence as you move forward? And I loved your scale because I wished we had that 25 years ago when we put that fifth vital sign down. And I'm, I, I hope we don't do that with screening and psychosocial screening. I hope we don't go down that road because there will be unintended consequences. But in the larger scheme, um, borrowing from you, Pam, I'm not sure I hear the patient's voice when you talked about you know, what we're going to do with psychosocial screening. I hear self-assessment by practices, but I'm not sure I hear the patient's voice. So all three of you. Oh, thank you. Um, and that's an uh, interesting um, point about the, um, the downstream unintended. It's, it's very hard for me to imagine, you know, quite frankly. And uh, I think that uh, pain scales and distress thermometers are very uh, in the moment, you know, so you get a lot of uh, variability. And I think people are sometimes more apt to screen when they see somebody who's, who's in pain or who's in distress. So, so I would hope, particularly looking at the family as a whole, that I would hope that you're always going to maintain this balance. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but a lot of the things on the PAT, for example, are not very likely to change or change quickly. You know, so, so I think uh, that's the case. I also think we're, we're not going to have a drug to address family um, distress. You know, and so the, the problems are always going to be uh, more difficult to treat and challenging. So perhaps um, in a way that may be a self-correction factor to, you know, to jumping to uh, ultimately do things that aren't appropriate. So certainly there may be unintended consequences, but first of all, I'll point out that most of the studies that have looked at if you just screen and don't tie it to an algorithm, makes no difference. So, so if all we do is assess the stress, nothing's going to change, no intent, unintended consequences. Uh, but uh, I think what's key there is that uh, screening, however it's done, needs to be linked with evidence-based recommendations for care. And that's how to avoid the unintended consequences. That practitioners know what patients should and should not receive if they screen positive for any of the things that have been identified. So, Anne, I want to thank you for a very thoughtful question, and I actually do worry about what could happen with child voice being used to trump parent voice. And that is um, a danger zone, I believe, for family health. So um, I strongly believe clinically that there are families where child voice um, is not legitimated and so should not be sought because it would um, inadvertently tip the balance and the internal definition of being a good parent would be threatened. So my take on that is, of course, not to use a voice to trump the other, but to use voices to emphasize family and the importance of family. And when there are those circumstances that I think Anne could speak to where inviting the child voice might disrupt the family boundaries, we um, seek permission from the family, the parents first, to invite the child voice, uh, sort of re reinforcing that there is a parent here who has a say. What I don't want to see happening in care, and particularly at end of life, is that we usurp the parent role. And when I do follow-up evaluations with families, um, there is positive com commentary about how we didn't usurp when we could have and then sadness when we might have usurped. Richard. Um, Richard Plotkin, Max Cure Foundation and Grandparents in Action. My question is directed to Anne. 
Uh, and when you're talking about the family stress levels, uh, it seems to me you're talking about one population uh, as opposed to breaking it down to different income levels. For example, uh, my grandson and my son and daughter-in-law lived on the Upper East Side in, well, in New York City, two blocks from Memorial Sloan. Uh, the stresses on them was much different. Uh, our foundation supports low-income families. Uh, Qualik, nine years old with brain cancer, lives in bed -Stuy. Mother lost her job as a crossing guard, hence lost her right to food stamps. I get a phone call that the neighbor's boyfriend was killed, was just shot by the former boyfriend, and they, and Kuali couldn't get to the hospital because the uh, apartment is now a crime scene. I get a phone call from Christian's parents that Christian is dying. Uh, the cemetery refuses to bury him. We need $5,300. I call the cemetery, I say, I'll guarantee it, because they weren't going to let the, the boy be buried. Uh, he wouldn't take my guarantee, but I got my donors, and I got $18,000. But the point is, when you're breaking down the different stress levels, my son and his family, Dr. Offinger, for example, is the doctor. My, son is a, my grandson's a survivor. Uh, Peter Adamson, I'm sure, is on my son's speed dial, because David, I think, calls him frequently. Uh, so how can you compare the stress levels from my family to that of Kuali's family? Yes, I, um, excellent points. I mean, per, perhaps I didn't stress that enough in, in discussing the PAT. The PAT actually helps you identify those very, is this on? Those very uh, factors. So um, the domains and the subscales include um, family structure, resources. Uh, the family stressors include you know, for example, um, a family member being in prison is is on there. So, so in a, in a fact, our 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 hope is that this type of assessment provides you with with that. Actually, some families may have um, higher levels of distress. Let's say they 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 it's not a financial concern. They may have um, a history of mental health problems in the family. They may have other types of chaos. But we want to be able to again say, is this a family where we need to make sure we're looking at them in the context of uh, economic and uh, cultural factors? I think um, I'm I'm very impressed um, in, a, in a negative sense with um, with what I'm learning about some of the families in our current study, where we're validating um, the Spanish uh, version of the PAT, for example, of um, you know in our area migrant uh, families. You know that are coming down to AI Dupont Hospital for uh, for treatment and living under extreme um, poverty, and I think that's probably what's driving that you know very preliminary um, data that I showed you with more of the Spanish-speaking families in the highest risk. So, good, very good points. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Feener, Children's Hospital, of Philadelphia. One, I, I can't help but just reflect on. I, I don't know the data on a comment made previously about linking the JCO um, pain scale with the current epidemic that we're suffering with outpatient uh, prescription drug use. And having seen my father recently have a compression fracture from his cancer in the ER, have a level of eight, and then nobody do anything about it, I'm not really sure that I'm really thinking that it was a bad idea. I think it's an incomplete idea in the hospital setting, one that we still, I would love to see the promise realized of pain management. But my question is, should, Pediatric hospitals, because we're different than adults. We often are taking care of children. We're licensed to take care of a pediatric age range, and we have parents who are in distress. So the question is, should we have a standard where we're able to meet the, not the hyperacute needs, but the, the needs of parents who are quietly depressed, will not go out for a referral, or the needs of siblings? Should a comprehensive cancer center for children really have the capacity to have somebody on faculty who can address the parents' needs if they need a, essentially some help even having the energy to go seek care and for the siblings because that's usually outside of the, uh, the gambit of what we think we own. But we often are frustrated, I'm sure, and you can talk to this. So what's the recommendation? You've screened, you've found they're in distress, and they can't access services or they're just not able to mobilize the energy to do so. Yes. <laughs> Can you be a little more succinct? 
Um, you know, excellent point, and I think there's always that tension in a pediatric center. So I'm, I'm a family therapist. You know, I'm, I don't identify first and foremost as a child, clinical child person, so that has always allowed me to do, to do that and to provide that family-centered treatment. It has become more difficult over time, you know, because of credentialing and money and other problems that we're not, you know, supposed to talk about, but, but are very real. But, but I think absolutely, I think if we really, uh, if we really endorse family-centered care, if we really take it seriously, then I think um, we need to be doing that and we need to be looking to make sure we have the types of expertise. I mean, I think of the example of um, the NICU as an example where, you know, the psychosocial providers in the NICU need to be adult-oriented uh, right. people. We, I, so a theme, I believe, is the need to respond to the needs of families in pediatric settings that, that stretch our boundaries a little bit because we have plenty of people, we have postpartum depression, we know it's gotta be there. The number of times we diagnose it, minuscule, the number of times that we actually take active steps to address it, vanishingly small. Paul, did you wanna comment at all from your perspective? It's been some time, but uh, I did work pediatric oncology at Sloan Kettering, and the philosophy then and as now is that, at least from a psychosocial perspective, the unit of care was the family, period. So I'm thinking about the data that Bob Knoll cited yesterday and published data that clearly links parent mood uh, to child mood and welfare and ability to focus then on learning, self-care. So clearly if we are going to treat the child, I believe we need to treat the family. One of the opportunities for healthcare intervention is when families under crisis and that's when we see them. Uh, further, we have data suggesting that when we have uh, anticipated end of life for families, bereavement care will not be available for all families and it will result then in friends being the primary source of bereavement care. I believe there's a chance then before a family leaves us with either the child dying or the child already having died, we have the opportunity to make a difference in family health while they are within our reach and they may not be within the reach of a healthcare professional shortly after leaving us. And with that segue, Bob. Bob Noel, University of Pittsburgh, and also the chair of the Behavioral Science Committee of the Children's Oncology Group. Um, sort of a quick comment related to this conversation and problem-solving skills training for caregivers. If you're in a children's hospital, there becomes a set of issues about how you put your notes together, where the notes live, how you might bill for these services. And I might suggest just from listening to this conversation today, you could begin to think about using something like problem solving skills training in conjunction with the PAT so you build a more systematic approach to how you could figure out which families might be at higher risk because I, like Ann, I really do believe that there's a large group of families who do quite well. And while I, the data clearly demonstrate that problem solving skills training helps everybody to feel better when they're distressed, um, this would be a way to begin to think about how you could target it in a systematic way. Um, my one question that I have, um, it was with great delight that I saw the promise measures and uh, actually used them last year in a school-based study where we were trying to understand a little more about peer relationships for brain tumor survivors. And I, I must say, and this is just my observation from my data, I was really kind of disappointed in the low correspondence between children's self-report. This was just group of several hundred children who completed the promise at the same time they told us who their best friends were, how much they liked each other, and used uh, really well-established social developmental measures. And we really got very low correspondence between the peer promise measure and what peers actually said. I, I think the peer promise dimension is more about self-concept or social self-concept, but not about peer relationships. You, I, just a. Have you published those data, Bob? 
We're working on it. <laughs> I'm actually excited to look at those data, and I don't, I don't have. More <laughs> I look forward to learning from it. <laughs> Uh, Patty Gans, UCLA. I just wanted to um, go back to uh, the theme that I talked about yesterday, which is really biopsychosocial mechanisms. And I was very impressed with Pamela's trajectory data because we see very much the same thing in adults, which is that there are people who have high symptomatology and it doesn't seem to be, you know, changed too much by the treatment. There are people who are low. I mean, there are these different trajectories. And in our work with uh, women with breast cancer who are fatigued, we've seen uh, variations in SNPs in the promoter regions of some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I would suggest that people come, and again, children have had less of a lifespan to have those kinds of exposures, but we actually find that people who are fatigued before they ever start their cancer treatment continue to be fatigued afterwards, and there have been many episodes of things that have stimulated them in the past to probably have some of these symptoms. So there may be biological connections. So when you get a pro questionnaire, think about the biology because the people who are going to be most at risk, this may be biologically predetermined in some way. And I think for the clinician scientist to understand the biology of the symptoms is very important. That's one thing that I want to make. I want to then also respond to the social stresses that people have in their lives. And we know a lot now about the HPA access and early social trauma that individuals have from deprivation in their home life and whatever it is. And their HPA access response, their stress and their cortisol response to what we would all be exposed to as a patient going through cancer may be very different. And that's also the priming of those individuals. So we can't just think about the symptoms and the self-report. I did that for many, many years. We need to think about the connection to the biology. And this will, in fact, inform our interventions because the kinds of interventions we need to do for patients may vary uh, depending on the mechanism by which they have the symptoms. And this may explain why we can give 100 individuals the same chemotherapy regimen some are extremely resilient and have few symptoms, and others are very troubled. And I, I think that's what I've learned as an adult oncologist trying to do this, and I would really hope uh, that pediatrics, because you have much more of a chance to capture the whole population in your studies, uh, to be able to understand this in, in better ways, because you've got uh, children who come in with a pretty clean slate, you know, in terms of past exposures. So, Patty, I'm incredibly excited about your comment. I'm in complete agreement and so, so glad that I'm sitting next to Dr. Adamson, <laughs> who actually has uh, the gateway for us embedding patient reported outcomes in all phases of clinical trials and linking them then to the biologic indicators that are being already collected so we can look at phenotyping, genotyping, and link it to patient reported outcomes. <laughs> Lori. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I think Nina was let, first. Let, no, let, let, let me. Let, let, I'll circle back to that. No, no, I'm not trying to escape it because I don't want to. Let, how are we on time? All right, well, give me. We're going to have time, Doctor. Okay. We can go through the break if we All right, so I'm going to back up, and I, I, I promise you I'm going to get to your question, but let me back up. And where, where there are similarities between pediatric oncology and medical oncology, and where there are some distinct differences. So pediatric oncology evolved over 60 years, all right, I think that's about right, Greg, 60 odd years since the first cooperative group trials began. And the subspecialty itself evolved over those same 60 years. And what happened quite remarkably in childhood cancer is that the research and the subspecialty became really fully intertwined, right? As I've always said, if you want to see a pediatric oncologist panic, tell them there's a new patient in clinic and there's not an open study. They panic. And that's rather uh, unique, um, and that is why we benefit from participation of uh, children and families uh, to a far greater extent than, than our colleagues in medical oncology. But that is not without unintended consequences. And I come back to, I think, Paul's very um, important distinctions between 
standard of care and clinical care guidelines. Um, you don't see those in pediatric oncology, um, in part because our research protocols have assumed those roles. Rightly or wrongly, they've assumed those roles. And that presents a, both a benefit and a, a risk and, a, and, a, and, a, and an opportunity for us. The reality is clinical care guidelines and standard of care, not everything that's standard of care, not everything that's a clinical care guideline should go into a research protocol. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be done, but it doesn't mean it should live in a research protocol. We actually do need clinical care guidelines perhaps to accompany our, our research protocols. So a lot, I think, my first answer, Pam, is Yes, um, these measures for patient reported outcomes should perhaps be part of clinical care, but that doesn't instantly mean the only way to deliver that and to use that information is to put it in the research protocol. If it's in the research protocol, there has to be a true research objective. Now, one of the objectives is to gather the data, and I understand that. One of the objectives may be can we link this data to a biological uh, variable? Yes. But in order to do that, you don't start by just putting it in there and then figuring out what our question is. You start with saying, what is our question? What resources do we have to answer that question? And then it actually does compete for the multiple other questions that we need and, and want to ask. I can tell you, that the primary question in any research study is certainly the most important. The list of what else people want to ask goes from here down the block. Right? Lots and lots of correlative science, lots of hypothesis generating. Many of those ideas are really good ideas. Not many of those ideas garner funding, and unfortunately the funding that we now receive truly limits to, uh, us to what we can ask. So in answer to your question, are we going to tomorrow put this in every clinical trial? No. Does it mean that we shouldn't do it? No. It perhaps should be part of standard of care. But does it present an opportunity where, yes, we want to ask a scientific question, we want to try to correlate it with certain genotype, other phenotype, what have you? Great opportunity, but that science then will compete with other science. So a long-winded answer to your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Nina Muriel from Dana-Farber. Um, uh, you know, I think you bring us back and forth between the research and the clinical care that we are trying to develop here together. And it's really a remarkable thing, actually, to be in the room with leaders in psychosocial oncology and palliative care and in oncology. And I think that's the clear uh, message here. And as we try to move forward, um, I think about how the way to get an oncologist's attention is to have a family in so much psychosocial distress that they're not receiving their tumor-directed therapy. That is where we all make ourselves most useful in the oncology setting, at the top of the pyramid, at the place where everybody's saying hi, 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 and the oncologist is saying help. You know, I can't deliver the oncology care that this child needs. And so I think we're thinking about how to deliver this care across a spectrum, both from those highly distressed families where we're just trying to get the chemotherapy into the child, um, that then to quality of life, thinking about suffering, thinking about existential issues and quality of life for the family as a whole. But I really wonder about where the responsibility for this is going to rest ultimately. Right? Paul talks about the institutional and the national pressures to try to get psychosocial care into the clinics um, in a real way. Um, but I think in pediatrics, we have a smaller venue. We have an environment in which to think about that. And so is that going to live, again, at the national level, at the institutional level, like at a children's hospital? Or does it also live in the oncology program? And again, because the oncology clinical director is going to know when there is a family in clinic who is so distressed they can't receive their chemotherapy. Um, and, and I just wonder if we could think about that a little bit and sort of at what level do we expect this to live in the pediatric realm? Yeah, 
Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, I think in developing um, standards, we are, in fact, looking for how we can best fan this out into practice. And I think that, um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of the group that we, we want to try to figure that out. We're not quite sure how to do that. Um, you know, I, I think about it in terms of, um, you know, contagion, you know, in a sense of, of people saying, I'm using this um, approach, it's working, it's recommended. I don't think it's ever going to be all top down. Um, but I think we, we, you know, we may need to really strategize about how um, to best make that happen. Research data are good. Um, word of mouth is good. Uh, you know, uh, the, the voices of authority are all good. But I, I don't really know. Um, I think it's a great question. Okay. I, well, I would say, uh, yeah, Paul, go ahead. Wherever it resides, and I'm not here to tell you where it should reside, there should be some way of measuring to see that it was done. And frankly, it may not be important where it resides, but you need to have some process in place to know that the minimal levels of acceptable care are being delivered. And I think we heard some very poignant stories yesterday where that didn't happen. And there has to be some process in place to make sure that that's not happening. So, uh, you know, that's the, the real issue. And I, I think, again, standards of care uh, will be interpreted differently at different institutions. Again, they're broad general statements. But the goal of them is to certainly make sure that the kinds of terrible things we heard about don't happen at particular institutions or in particular healthcare systems because that's unacceptable. Lori. Okay, there's so much to respond to. I'm like, where to start? Lori Wiener, NCI. First, to call out to Paul, you know, which I, we didn't do yesterday, because the whole project for standards of care was instrument. Paul was instrumental in helping us, and hearing his presentation today, there's no surprise why. Um, the second was to the child's voice, and um, nobody wants the child's voice to trump a parent's voice. But if you think about Joanne's slide yesterday, where you ask a child, how, how are you? It's just like, fine. Parents are so relieved to find out how their child is really doing. Most of the time they say, I don't know, I can't tell. They're sad, they're not really talking, they say everything is fine, but they look grumpy. They're just desperate to be able to really find out how they're doing. And data that we didn't present is that 9% of these children endorse suicidal ideation. And when parents learn that, they're generally really relieved because they just didn't know how the child was doing. So for that, the no, there's no downside I can see unintended consequences, but at least pulling that out into the open that we can provide services to a desperately sad child. And the last is Chris, I don't know where you are, but um, thank you for those comments. But something that wasn't mentioned today, and if you listen to the voices you heard yesterday, is bereavement care. And I know we don't want to talk about funding, but all of the services and comprehensive care, as beautiful and heroic, as wonderful as we may make that to be, when a family leaves that center for all that care they got, and then they're home without all of us or any of us, except for an occasional phone call, there's a real drop in services. And um, it's unconscionable to me. And I think that we really do need to think about preventative to deal with acute crisis, but think beyond that. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Um, Smita? Do you, do you have time? Uh, yeah. Smita from UAB. Um, I think the, congratulations to the panel. Beautiful job. Um, one thing that uh, we all struggle with in the real life is a paucity of psychosocial support. And that didn't, I didn't hear that. Um, in the real world, we are struggling with, if you're going to take the whole family-centered approach, especially in the adult world, a lack of psychosocial support where there's one social worker supporting 6,000 patients, how do we address that? Is it a billing issue? Is it a lack of vision on the leadership part issue? How do we handle that? And can that become a recommendation in terms of how should we provide care to the patient and their family? I just want to make two observations just based on the adult oncology world, and that is that um, you always heard that there are no resources, there are no resources, there are no resources, and yet suddenly when it's a mandate from the Commission on Cancer, the valves begin to open up. And uh, our, our R25E program, we encourage a psychosocial professional to come with their administrator so that the two of them can work together on the plan so that you don't have these unfunded programs. Uh, the other issue is that, at least in the adult world and certainly in Florida, 
the fee-for-service world is rapidly vanishing. And uh, bundled care either represents our greatest promise or our greatest challenge. Because if we can get into bundled care packages, then there'll be some reimbursement for what we provide. If we don't, then we're sunk. So that's why it's critical that we are at the table when these pathways are being developed and when these contracts are being written. And certainly that's something that I actively push for at my institution. I think it's, it's a huge problem and a, and a huge issue. I think there's a lot of different models for providing psychosocial care and I don't think that we have a good handle on who's doing what and how they're doing it and how successful they're doing it. So I really do think the, the first thing is to really get some good data on that. Because some places, um, say we have X number of social workers, but are they covering a wider range of services? Um, are, they, are they focused? If I go on a website and try to find psychologists who are at hospitals and I know that they are there, I can't find them on the website. Um, you know, again, what, what, does that, uh, what does that mean? There are, um, you know, screening is one of the activities in the Affordable Care Act. You know, I think there are ways that we should be able to be um, more creative and persistent in overcoming some of the barriers. But I think that it is at this, at all these different levels, like really saying this, this is an important um, integral part of care that we have to support. And I think that that should be a recommendation and, and put some pressure on um, institutions to come up with ways to support it. The other thing that I see, by the way, that, that worries me too is to say, okay, we have to provide psychosocial support. So how low can we go in terms of the credentials of the people providing that? And I've seen some situations there that, that I'm worried that are disasters waiting to happen if you don't have the appropriate level of expertise. We have time for one more question. Lori? Uh, Lori Manassian, uh, Division of Cancer Prevention, NCI. So this has been a wonderful forum for discussing so much research that's been going on as well as the needs and hearing a wide variety of aspects from treatment, the actual research that's being done in psychosocial research for pediatric oncology, as well as the needs clinically. Um, and and it's, there, it's begging for a transition. The valley of death doesn't apply just to drugs. And so it's begging for some sort of a transition or forum across. Um, and, and I would love to see, as a consequence of this, further discussions that seek to bridge that. One of the mechanisms for that bridging, truthfully, could be the cancer control portfolio for the, um, for the pediatric oncology group, OK? Um, we have, in fact, funded in the adult groups, Paul Jacobson's stress, um, web-based stress intervention. We have funded the distress screening for lung cancer patients through the RTOG. We funded a study through the, what was the GOG for, it was the nurse write-in for um, uh, symptoms and health-related quality of life for ovarian cancer patients. Where there was a need, we tried to fill in some of those gaps. We intentionally, in putting forward the NCORE RFA, the revised or new or restructured community wow. clinical trials program, we put into their observation and longitudinal studies intentionally so that there wasn't this requirement that there had to be an intervention with the idea that if some of these things need to be evaluated first so you can identify the best intervention, then you can do it. On top of that, the Alliance is now doing the randomized control trial for Jennifer Timmel's palliative care study. So there is a lot more flexibility and creativity that could be done in this transition bridge through the cancer control portfolio and also cancer care delivery, although we're still trying to figure out what that means, okay? so. <laughs> So under the new structure, there are clinical trials planning meetings. Um, I think we could be a little bit flexible. We on the quality of life and cancer control style study have done alternative things and not just true clinical trials planning meetings. And a, my, a nice next step after this might be to look very specifically at that transition zone, not, not care, because NCI doesn't fund care. But we could be that bridge for helping COG and the other organizations that are here think about a strategic approach 
to funding the transition between the research we have today to improve psychosocial care for our pediatric oncology patients and families to into um, the next steps, which would be what really works, what do we know works, what's simple, you know, because the other thing is we have a text messaging study that SWOG is doing for aromatase inhibitor compliance. I thought the study, and I forgive me, I forget who presented it, of the 16-week, a single text um, for the adolescents um, was a phenomenally productive way Okay, so we're doing a similar kind of study, albeit over two years, with the aromatase inhibitors and compliance for patients. There are things that can be done through the cancer control portfolio that may help serve as that transition bridge. Um, and so that's what I would suggest. Well, well thanks, Laurie and Anne and Pam. There is going to be a video link to this that you can embed in the grant application. So, <laughs> so I think that's a real opportunity. <laughs> Well, with that, I want to thank um, Paul and, and Pam. Uh, this really was a, a tremendous. Oh, I'm Can sorry. There's I one just more, say one thing. I, one I more know we're probably yes, running please. out of time, Peter. And my question is really addressed to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I thank you for giving me just time to say something because of what Nina said. She kind of inspired me to come up here and say something. Um, you know, it's on behalf of parents, and I think hearing Melinda yesterday as a survivor, I feel the need to actually say something. Um, and Pamela talked about giving a voice. Um, so I feel like I, I wanted to say something on behalf of uh, parents and survivors. Um, I, I, I think the past two days we've been hearing about the importance of psychosocial support and mental health needs. And um, I, I think it's, it's so important to incorporate these things within the care of our children um, and our, our survivors. And I was particularly amazed after hearing Melinda's story yesterday, how she still seems to be struggling um, with questions about her care and um, you know the directions of her care. And I guess as we're working on a standard for psychosocial support, um, and Nina saying, where is this going? And I guess as, as a leader of foundation, I, I guess I would throw it out to you as, as the director of COG, is I realize that can't be part of a research protocol, but I would hope that just like there is guidelines for survivorship, which I would hope somehow that would be helping Melinda, which I, I'm stunned. I don't hope you would be stunned that she, is, she seems to be a little floundering. I would want more support from Melinda. But I'm hoping that COG would want to support psychosocial standards of care somehow to endorse those standards within COG institutes. I mean, somehow, that that would be embraced, not through a research protocol, but th through embracing those through all of your institutions and to, and to, and to request that as a standard of care. So, so thank you. I think you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Um, and, and don't misinterpret that the importance of this for pediatric oncology. We have, um, we have a, an enormous gap in what we do. And our role in COG is to drive the research that's going to narrow that gap to support the research and ultimately to support the care and uh, outcome for all children with cancer. So it is a high priority. Um, you've heard from Lori Manasian as far as are there going to be opportunities where we can get money to actually do some of the important research that's going to bridge the gap. We have historically done psychosocial research in, in COG. Have we done enough of it? No. Do we need to do more? Yes. Um, but we do have a, a survivorship and outcomes program. We do have a whole behavioral science committee that, that Bob leads. So it is high profile. It is high priority. Um, but we're not going to do this alone. And the fact that your foundation and other foundations are there is critically important to our being able to deliver this. The NCI can't do this alone. COG can't do it alone. But in partnership, I really think we can bring some of the tools that have been developed here, Anne's tool that is used in 50 centers, well, it's kind of hard to believe it's not used in 250 centers. I think patient reported outcomes 
is, a, is an evolving area. It is going to become part, part of standard. But we need, obviously, to learn what's going to work, what the effective interventions are. And then we need a healthcare system that can respond to the children and families. So we can't do this alone. Advocacy groups and foundations are, are critically important. And um, you're, you're right on target. So with that, I do again want to thank uh, the three great speakers and a wonderful session.